All right, welcome to the podcast, Jake. Oh, great to be here, Ethan. Thank you. Oh, so nice. Yeah, I figured we'd just start out. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your background, how you got to doing what you're doing today, uh, a little mm. bit more context on the film you created, uh, just mm. in that domain. I'd love to hear you riff on it. Cool. Well, I started out kind of as an OG Wilberian, kind of into the integral scene in my early 20s, late teens, um, was pretty thirsty to find a community uh, to start banging around ideas with. And I ended up in Portland, Oregon at an integral salon for six years. And I was also interested very much in futurism generally. Uh, I had come across this this kind of cutting edge uh, methodology that was that that I heard of uh, from Bruce Sterling, one of my favorite sci-fi authors, uh, and and the chairman of Cyberpunk, <laughs> and he talked a lot on Twitter about, uh, and even before that on his blog on about uh, design fiction, which is sometimes also called speculative fiction, and this to me was like uh, just pure gold i mean i mean the thought that i could sort of use my philosophical understanding of the world and and you know insert a kind of a diegetic prototype into the context of a future that its purpose is to kind of highlight the technosocial context within which you know that 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 object exists i mean this was like story world building you know and that's fascinating to me. Um, so spent a lot of time in the interrope community, did a lot of projects over the years, met a lot of fantastic people, did a lot of embodied training programs all under that kind of umbrella, you know, and then ended up uh, hearing about this game B thing. Um, I was listening to a podcast by Daniel Schmachtenberg. It was like neuro hacker uh podcast yeah and i heard daniel schmachtenberger and then i heard jordan hall on uh, future thinkers podcast and i'm like holy mackerel these guys are fucking sharp <laughs> right and uh and they're really they really feel like they're living into the moment in a way that i hadn't uh that i hadn't felt in a while um mm. so i i dove you know deep as i do when i when my sort of heart gets interested <laughs> <laughs> and uh and um eventually you know reached out to J actually had reached out to daniel first he said well we've got a cool kind of project that's on the dl going down um we're looking for experts and so forth um but i'm gonna put you in touch with somebody uh and he put me in touch with uh, zach stein um who i knew he was part of the integral scene he was another og wilberian uh, had met him a couple years before at, at 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 the integral conference one of the integral conferences and mm. i always thought he was a luminary and uh they told me about they told me a little bit about the project they were doing called the ephemeral group process not a lot has come out about it it's kind of still low-key at the moment i think mm. <laughs> but he also mentioned that he said you know we're going to be doing, he kind of started detailing the Consilience project as well. And he said, we're wanting to do like an animation, get together an animation team to, you know, kind of bring some image and form to, to these ideas. And, and I said, well, count me in there, man. And he said, that's great. But, you know, we'll get back to you in a few months because we're not close you know, so really? I waited and waited and then I couldn't wait anymore. So I kept listening to the, <laughs> to the kind of the whole, you know, liminal web scene. And, and I fucking love Jim Rutt, man. I mean, this guy mm -hmm. just, you know, the, the pathos in his energy, right. And the, and, and just, you know, his story as a kind of a, it's almost like a mea culpa story. Like this guy, you know, mastered game A and then, <laughs> right. and then got bored it's like i'm ready for game b so i reached out to him and i said jim let's do something with this game b thing I, i'm i'm i just got out of i had just gotten out of uh being a marketing director at an ed tech company in scottsdale uh it was a bit of a nightmare of an experience kind of 
uh, wanted to, uh, it, was, it was really a death and a resurrection after leaving that place. Uh, and so I wanted to fully step into something that just, you know, resonated deeply with my heart. And, and so I said, Jim, let's go, man. And, and he was down. He was 100% down. He quickly kind of caught the buzz. And, and then that's, that's where, we, that's where we, we ended up with this Game B film. Nice, nice. And so I'm curious how, so you get kind of getting into this space from the sort of Wilbur integral scene. And then how, how has your kind of perception of game B shifted and morphed over time through creating this film? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure sitting with it, creating the script and, and really working on it for, for as long as you did, I'm sure you went really deep into the game B scene. Um, mm. it, like, what came out of that process of, of, you know, sitting with game B for that long in, in yeah. creating, creating a beautiful piece around it. Yeah. You know, I, I think I'm a little weird in the respect that what motivates me most to create art is actually like philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's been like that for a while, but, I mean, you know, I'll, I've been obsessed with film. I studied film in college and so forth and, and you know, animation and everything uh, is a craft of mine. But, um, but, but it's always, I, I always go to the philosophers. I always go to the sages. Um, and, and, and I just, because I feel like mining from there gives me the best kernels of, you know, of, of truth and beauty, you know, to, to try and bring form to. Right. uh yeah so so i just yeah i just went deep with the game b community and 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 you know the whole construct of game b is really kind of almost like what i was talking about before you know speculative fiction it, it was it's kind of like you know you know they were very clear up front like game b does not exist you know uh, i think of it a bit like a muse like you know every artist mm -hmm. has his muse right and right. and um game b muse because game b is a protopian vision it's like I, I feel like game b is is a muse who's like always walking ahead of you and and you know of course you never capture the muse right you you can never achieve the muse the muse always is walking ahead of you right <laughs> yeah uh, and you know they've got their problems too right right and 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 that's what's cool about the protopian vision is that, you know, th that's got to be part of it, right? It's like, if you're just designing rainbows and, you know, utopias, that's not a realistic vision of the future. It's not hard sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it felt like that's what uh, uh, Cadell was talking about in the, in the Stoa Dark Renaissance. Mm. It, this is something that I was really sitting with was like he he kind of I he laid out some critiques of of game mm -hmm. B in the sense of like always thinking that there needs to be some future that isn't here and he said something like a versus a and b thinking or something like this where mm -hmm. um where he was like yeah we're, we're in this current undesired state and we need to get to this future one that's not yet here um versus we're in it right now and what are we what do we have to work with and i'm sensing like two kind of separate uh dialects oh, yeah. here one is like you need the vision in order to like all right here's the here's where we're trying to go it's, we don't know what it's going to look like but like that pro provides some direction to move in and it yeah. provides motivation versus his thinking of like if you already if you're always trying to get to a system that's not that you can never get to then what's the point almost I love it. It's great discussion. To me, it comes down to temperament and typology. You know, there's just, there are certain people who inhabit the kind of the prophetic or the visionary archetype, you know? Right. I mean, you can trace history and see, I mean, everything that we have now was, you know, foretold in some prototypical form, <laughs> you know, right. years, years or many years, sometimes decades or mm -hmm. hundreds of years before it actually right. came to be, right? Uh, I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of cinema, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey had the, had the, had the 
the iPad in there, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a glib example, but there's so yeah. many examples like that, uh, right? I, I think for some archetypes, for some, you know, people, that visionary exercise, that speculative design um, can be can be fruitful. And, you know, you can really create a kind of a, a vision or a felt sense or a vibe of the future that then people kind of gravitate around and then they want to they want to help create it you know they want to see themselves into that future and and make it their own you know right. i'm all for that i don't i don't think that's an issue uh for some people you know doesn't work and uh, mm. we, we we need them all <laughs> right right yeah. so i'm i'm fascinated to explore um how your current understanding after making this film and going into the game B space for a while, your current understanding of like competition or like how you're relating to competition and conflict. Uh, we were speaking a little bit before, um, mm -hmm. before the recording about this in terms of uh, a lot of what got brought up in the critiques of the film was that you need conflict and competition in order to, you know, drive human action in order to drive, yes. you know, pathos is what they were talking about is, is necessary. And um, and I, I, I got the sense of all the critiques were kind of uh, perceiving game B as a sort of wanting like a harmonious, utopian, peaceful future. That's a straw man. Which, which <laughs> does feel like a straw man. It definitely a feels like man. a straw man. And so I'm curious, uh, yeah, how, how do you sit with competition, healthy competition and conflict versus, yeah. you know, uh, game A kind of competition oh, and conflict? Yeah. Well, listen, we're humans and human beings are in some sense differentiate themselves from all the other species by virtue of desire, right? The, the, the sheer fact that we desire something. Uh, and this is all like, you know, Rene Girard stuff. Like the, the fact that we have desire means we're going to always be in competition with one another. Uh, I don't aim to escape competition. I think the question is what's the balance between competition and cooperation? You know, I mean, a lot of the, if you listen to a lot of Schmachtberger and Hall, you know, they, you know, I think one of the, the main thesis there is that we're in a situation of, of, you know, incredible asymmetry, right? There, there is a lot of competition going on right. <laughs> and, and really not enough cooperation. Uh, and, and we're in a situation globally now as we get into become a planetary civilization that we have to learn to cooperate on a global scale, right? Um, if our problems in the meta crisis are global now, uh, then, then we have to cooperate on that level. Right. Yeah. And so do you perceive like, I, I'm, I'm feeling like a distinction between like, you know, you have win-lose type of competition where, and, I, and I, I, I'm curious to hear um, where you're at with this is, after I spoke yesterday, this example arose of, you know, you're having, you're having a conversation with a bunch of friends, right? And you're just, you're just hanging around, you know, you're hanging in the living room, just having a conversation or something like that. And, yeah. you know, there, there's like different types of competition that can arise, right? Like mm. some people, if you if you kind of take this kind of sort of game theoretic approach, you know, the sort of game theoretic approach is like dominance, right? So it's like, I need to like dominate this conversation. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're focused on being right rather than pursuing truth, right? So you're like, yeah. how do I just like, if, if, if what I see is most valuable is just being right, then I'm just going to use dominating strategies, you know, to just, oh, like yeah. just, uh, just to be like super macho and like, oh, my position is better because I said so or whatever. You get in all right. these like kind of win-lose competition dynamics. And I'm really sitting with what, what might it look like, you know, to, to be in a sort of dynamic where you have competition. Now, I, I think this is what I, I there was something in, uh, the talk on rebel wisdom with uh schmachtenberger hall and, and wheel where, where they mm -hmm. talked where they talked about this uh 
there's a competition present, but there's always this background awareness. I think they called it like the Omega rule or something. There's yeah, rule this, Omega. Yeah, yeah, rule Omega. There's always this background knowing of like, there's something that you have that I don't. And there's some partial truth that you have that I'm unable to see. And so right. I'm always going to assume that they're, that you're, you're coming from some sort of signal there, which, which feels like you can still have competition, but it feels like if that's present, yes. that's like a, a slightly different style of competition, it feels like. Absolutely. That's exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, there's the question of, is it zero sum or non-zero sum, you know? And yeah, and exactly like looking at the container within which the game of competition is played, mm. you know, is it a container of levity? Is it a container that is set up to evolve over time? Or is it one where the winner takes all and then you just, you know, have a segregated class of people for hundreds of years, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I do think you know these. This uh, it was one thing they mentioned in the in the game be responsive. It was uh, bringing in you know bringing in this question of class. So for, it was very important here. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, is is your game zero sum? Is it non zero sum? Is it is it done in the spirit of levity? Is it will it change over time? Does it have a built in expiration date? You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, all right. I'm super curious to hear you mentioned you went super deep into Bard's work. Um, and it seems like he has some critiques. So he, he, he's critiqued game B quite a lot. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very curious, you know, what you've discovered from going so deep into Bard's work and, oh. you know, the, especially his critiques of game B or how you kind of see perceived yes. the dialectic between his work and game B. Oh, Yes. Yes, it was, it was part of my master plan here to get him involved in the game B scene. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was my des my design fiction was to bridge these two communities, and and I have uh, 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 succeeded. <laughs> uh, I love I love Bard's emphasis on look his looking at deep history. The first thing that kind of caught me was his tr um, tribal mapping. You know, he talks mm. about. And you'll see those images in the in the film. He talks about how you know the early nomadic tribe had the, you know everyone had a had a kind of a chief that was in charge of the outer circle membrane, and this is where your warriors and your hunters were, right? Mm. This is the masculine energy, and then in the on the inside it was the matriarch, and you know with the women and the children, and they're sort of like you know doing intergenerational transmission in there and like raising children and and you know they're, they're literally like the reproductive organ of the tribe <laughs> right, you know, right and then right. and then you have the sage or he calls it the priest i call it the sage who is the intertribal archetype mm. so the 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 archetype that that goes in between tribes so they're the kind of the ones that you know work with the chief and say hey instead of going to war with those guys why don't we trade and by the way i can speak their language because they let me you know chill over there right. <laughs> you know and, and they're kind of like the the web the interconnectors you know mm -hmm. and they're also in charge of you know uh the will to intelligence right it, it, back then it was kind of like we didn't have written language you had to literally store everything you knew in your head and uh <laughs> <laughs> and tell the stories right uh and then you have the androgynous that is between the inner and the outer circle and those are like your artists and your hairstylists you know and your and your the, the gossipers the ones that, that basically hold a good balance of masculine and feminine mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of act as a bridge between the inner and the outer circle um that just that whole kind of archetypal gestalt just was like wow it resonated so deeply with me and just makes a lot of sense and has a lot of explanatory power even mm. in our world today <laughs> right. so, so i'm interested in that and and you know and also he talks about i think he he matches these up with those three archetypes where there's the split phallus so you have the chief and the sage the sage is the will to intelligence uh, or the priest he calls it and then the chief is uh, the will to transcendence. It's like, let's leave this tribe better than the year 
than than better than last year. Let's or better than my father did. We're gonna make we're gonna go forward here, right? Right. Uh, and you know, so they're the builders and the engineers of the future. And uh, um, so, but all these three roles have to be in a tensegrity. Are you familiar with that term? I'm not. No. Tenseg. Tense. I think it was a Bucky Filler. Bucky Fuller term. Um, it's where there's both, you know, a push and a pull, right? Mm, mm, um, so th there's actually like these, you know, tables and things, these architectural items where it requires a certain degree of tension, you know, of attraction and repulsion, you right, know. Right. And so they're kind of set up in a dynamic trialogos with each other, mm. right? And, and each one almost has its own religion and set of customs and, and you know, and culture and, right? they're very orthogonal right in that sense um but they're all needed and they all need to always be in con conversation with with each other and he talks about how if you try to collapse to any two of the archetypes you're going to run into trouble for example the if, when the when the chief tries to become a sage as well and you know you know that he becomes a tyrant right mm -hmm. They need to all kind of respect each other's roles. And uh, I tried to point that out in the film. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, yeah. So how, I'm trying to make the connection here. Uh, yeah. The archetype seems to be very present in your film. You know, you have, yeah. the, they're all dialoguing with each other and the speech bubbles are popping up and everything. How does, how do you relate? I didn't fully make the connection between like archetypes and, and and how that related with this game be a world that you were kind of uh painting painting in this film you know like yeah like, well know, how... the, yeah sorry yeah that that goes back to your question um part of his critique you know he talks about the, another triad which which sort of maps matches up i think with the archetypes um logos pathos and mythos right and that um so the film, if you think of a dry explainer film, it's really just logos, right? And if you think of a story, that's mythos. Uh, and then, you know, the pathos is all the stuff that you're not supposed to t talk to kids about, right? The death, the violence, the sex, the right, right. <laughs> right, that good stuff. Um, he's arguing that that this vision, this gamey vision is, is, is radically absent of the pathos. And I, and I agree. I 100% agree. You know, and this is this is also true in the integral community. Uh, I've been a part of a lot of these groups, you know, and you go and just he's right. Everybody's got a smile on their face and it feels cre almost creepily utopian. But it also feels good. I mean, for fuck's sakes, I mean, right? in a world where there's pathos everywhere you fucking turn, it's kind of nice to go there every once in a while. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. So I think, he, you know, he just he just. You know, he, he says, you know, the vision needs to include both. So in our in my story, it was mostly logos and mythos. And he's saying it was absent the pathos. I agree. Uh, although not entirely. I mean, we did have a sequence that showed the collapse of human civilization. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and a nasty yeah. parasite on her neck. Mm -hmm. uh, so. But yeah, I think he just he wants to avoid that kind of he wants to avoid the vibe and the sentiment of, uh, you know, these pillar saints and these boy pharaohs, as he calls them, mm. uh, who just, you know, try to create a kind of a pre-tragic future utopia, right? It's like, right. no, 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 we got to go post-tragic. You know, this is what I love about Zach Stein's metapsychology. I'm not sure if you're familiar. If not, you should. You got to get him on here. Uh, he talks about ensoulment as three stations of pre-tragic tragic and post tragic and so this is separate from you know how we develop cognitively you know through our uh, uh, language and so right. forth and then um and, and even even uh, uh, um you know with regard to our awareness you know doing doing meditations it's it's, it's a different vector when ensoulment is is about going deep within it's about going down mm -hmm. and into the depths right and in some sense, you, you're not mature until you've experienced death and tragedy, right? But you can get stuck in it, which is, it seems, where a lot of our culture is today. Right. Uh, but we need to get out on the other side of that. And that's what I would love 
you know, brought into this conversation because I agree with Bard and Cadell and Raven and, 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 and Cox, you know, we need the pathos. That's sort of the tragedy element in life, right? But we also have to get beyond it. Like, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people stuck in it. We have to say, what's on the other side of that? You know, mm-hmm. so that so there's a sort of faction on Twitter called the Doomer Optimists, which is fantastic. It's like they're Doomer, but they're also optimists. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like it's like we're actually going to set up a, a culture where when the collapse comes, we're good. Like we're ready to go. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I'm I'm getting this picture of like I don't know if you've seen um, the depiction of like the pre, the pre trans fallacy uh oh yeah the graph where it's like the the beginning looks the same as the end and then the middle is just yes. like right and that, i'm getting that picture of like you know hasn't faced death is only right. focused on death and then yes then doesn't really care about death but because they've grappled with it so long that now that's kind of trans trans tragic hey, amen awesome. nailed it you nailed awesome. it yeah that meme there's a meme there's the meme yeah there's the meme. <laughs> yeah uh, oh yeah this is really good so yeah yeah because i'm getting the sense of like a lot of the critiques were kind of pointing at this kind of pre it sounds like if using what you just laid out the pre-tragic like oh like yep. you don't want to be pre-tragic you don't want to just like completely avoid death and what yes. i'm hearing is like it seems like a lot of the critiques were from this tragic space. Like, all right, like the world is dark. It, yeah. it, that's what it felt like. The world is dark. There's, there's yeah. destruction. There's, you know, sexual energy that just wants to yeah. just, you know, that go around and yeah. uh, fuck some shit up. <laughs> and yeah, then, right. uh, <laughs> but <laughs> there's something on the other side of that too. And I guess what I'm trying to reconcile in, in, in taking a lot of the, the critiques in, in the Stoa, in, in the talk the other day is you know i guess i guess the sentiment is not to repress all of the pathos right so i'm trying to, i'm trying to yeah. feel into that of like what is it like to one go through all the pathos and like all right go mm. through the tragic phase and then mm. what does it look like to come out on the other side you know what does it look mm. like to to not be so focused on it but to also not repress it and sweep it all under the rug and pretend uh-huh. that everything's perfect you know Amen, man. That's it. That's the question. And I guess that's what the Doomer optimists are trying to do. I mean, you know, you can look at this, you know, I'm sure you have had these experiences personally. Like when I moved, when I was in college, you know, and I kind of entered the, uh, the machine, the factory. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was, it was devastating, man. It was devastating to me. I'm just like, this is it. This is what I worked so hard in high school for, uh, (laughs) to sit in a class with 250 people and the teacher doesn't even know my fucking name. Like, no, I had an existential crisis, uh, full on, full blown. I remember, I remember laying down in the middle of the road just looking up at the sky saying, I got to do something. I got to do something. So I did So I, I fucked off to uh, Portland. I found that there was this integral salon up there. I had just found Ken Wilber through a friend and integral theory. And, uh, and, and I, I had never even visited Portland, Oregon. And, uh, but, but I had heard that it was, you know, very green and kind of progressive, you know, <laughs> mm. I'm like, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the utopia I'm looking for. <laughs> So I, I just moved, I moved with, you know, two weeks notice, just dipped out and was there for six years. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, right. And so, you, you know, that's kind of the experience that the soul leads you to. It's like, free yourself, man. Like, uh, feel something, mm. feel it strong, mm. you know, and, and, but also take in, take in, take in the horror and grieve, you know, it took me, mm no joke i mean the six years i was there it was it was grieving it was you know but i was going deep into studies i was i was looking at all of his wilbur's footnotes you know everybody in the footnotes we were going and diving down you know on that and and i was learning as much as i can of course i'm a type five in the enneagram type five so very heady type 
Um, so that's my <laughs> that's my outlet. It's like you know, I must I must figure my way out of <laughs> crisis, yeah. right? But so for others, it's different, right? There's body types and heart types, you know, yeah. and they and they they respond differently. Blessing and a curse. Uh, that's right. That's type. right. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, this is good stuff. I'm curious about you, your experience. Did you have this deep existential crisis in your life? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, many of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely, I definitely had. I actually didn't end up going to college because I was just like, mm. you know, I had the, I had the capacity to. Um, but yes. I was like, one, that's a lot of debt to go to college. It's too much debt. It's, it's like good why? for you, bro. I did the yeah. same. I, I only last. I only lasted two years, and I yeah, was out. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. Every in high school, it feels like college is the only thing. You know, it's like, oh, this is like seen as the only next step that you can possibly take. And so it was very difficult to to choose not to do the what seemed like the only next step. And it, it kind of felt like a leap of faith. You know, like, all right, I'm gonna figure something out. I'm gonna figure right. something out. I just don't know what it's gonna be and what it will look like. Um, yes. So it was a bit of a crisis, and then you know, working, working with various psychedelics as well, threw me into some Absolutely. crises. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. But, <laughs> uh, they tend to do that. <laughs> they, they do tend Sacrament. to do that. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> almost without a doubt, if, if you want one, <laughs> just, That's just right. take too big of a dose. <laughs> just, get, uh, just get yourself a hero's dose. Right, good right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think Wil Wilbur's work really opened my eyes, but as I started diving into philosophy and metaphysics and ontology, is when it was mm. is when a lot of the, you know, which I feel like to this day I'm just consistently grappling with. Um, yeah. All right. There's this traditional sort of ontology that is given to me by my culture, but then there's some philosophers over here that give me a different ontology and a different way of viewing mm -hmm. who I am, what the world is, what reality is, which doesn't feel very common and not very many people are talking about it but yet if you go in that circle if, if you find circles of people that are into it it feels just as real right go, oh yeah like going to like a zen community for example a zen monastery is just like a complete reality shift and yes yeah spend a little bit of time in a in kind of a quasi quasi monastery and and it felt like such like a shock to the system i was like i could travel to a foreign country and, and oh yeah and that wasn't even as shocking as going to a zen monastery where their entire perception of self and world is is they're working with a different perception of self and world mm. and different ontology so yeah i've been in this consistent process of just grappling with that grappling with you know uh insights from meditation yes and but yet also these days I've been very inspired by the intellectual space. You know, you, you mm. listen to some of these people and it's like, I, I'm in this space of, I just had, I, I'm not going to say a crisis, but uh, yesterday I just had this kind of moment where I was like, oh shit, the, the content that I'm taking in is not going to lead me anywhere if I only take it this caliber of content for the rest of my life, right? Like, if this is the type of content that I'm, that I'm, mm -hmm. that I'm feeding myself, there's no right. way I'm going to, you know, develop the, these intellectual capacities that I, that I look up to. And a lot of these yes. people that you're mentioning and we're talking about and that, that yeah. are in this liminal web space. And so I'm like, uh, speaking with uh, OG Rose yesterday and just a brilliant mm -hmm. mind. And I'm like, how, how does this like how does he how did he develop this mind and same with Schmachtenberg and all like how do they develop these minds you know and yes. I think I just kind of landed on well I need to start reading some of the you know original text that, that gave rise to these ideas so like what are some mm -hmm. original uh, economists or original philosophers or original mm -hmm. you know like I'm reading all of the all like I, I noticed that all of the stuff I'm taking in is like stuff that was written in the last 10 15 years I was yes. like, all right, I need to take in some stuff from 200 years ago, from 100 years right. ago, just older, older stuff and get more of the source text themselves mm -hmm. and, and really grapple with, um, 
I, I guess what I'm noticing is like a lot of like this, the game B talk and a lot of this stuff, it feels like the, the, the one, the, how I relate to a lot of this stuff is I, I love it. And yet at the same time, sometimes I get this subtle energy of like, we're going to create the new system that's never been created before. And it's oh, like, yeah. it's like, wait a sec. But the, the thing that we're trying to transcend is something that humanity has been grappling with for hundreds and hundreds of years. Exactly. And there's, yeah. there's so much text written. I just uh, like, yeah. I just am not even realizing like that, like for example, Verveke's meaning crisis. Oh yeah. Where yeah. I was like, whoa, like we're in a meaning crisis. What is happening? And I was, as, as I was speaking to uh, OG Rose yesterday, um, he was talking about this meaning crisis thing in a completely different way. He was like, oh yeah, we've, humanity's always been in a meaning crisis. We're never not in a meaning crisis. We're always trying to figure out how to find yeah. meaning in the world. And basically he's saying what the meaning crisis is, isn't like, a new thing where we're trying to we're hmm. just all of a sudden plopped into a meaning crisis he's like no actually there were there are ways to find meaning he's like there's some ways of finding meaning war totalitarianism you know yeah uh sexism xenophobia like these are yeah. ways that people find meaning he's like the meaning crisis yeah. isn't new it's just that we've upped our standards and we're like we're not gonna we're not gonna lower ourselves to those ways of producing meaning we we're gonna up our standards because we're not you know, we're not going to, we're not going to accept violence as a way, as a way of finding meaning, or we're not going to accept, you know, mm. a, any of these, you know, communism as a way of finding meaning. In the world, no, like exactly. That. We're going to, we're going to find a third way. And that's right. Game B. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And then that's the game B space. It's like, <laughs> all right. And then I, I think, I think what's so fascinating to me is, all right, this game B space, it's like, what would game B look like? And then part of me is like, all right, now let's go back to the philosophers that have been grappling mm -hmm. with what does a, a new form of meaning look like for hundreds of years? Like, let's let's bring them into the picture and and try to scaffold off their work rather than trying to build a game B that's somehow isolated mm -hmm. from the rest of the thinkers from all the great thinkers of you know history. Right, right, and 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 you know, according to the film, you know, I think also it's time that that the sages really kind of hooked up with the with the uh, matriarchs and the and the chiefs you know jim rod it, jim rod i love because you know he's kind of the chief he's to me he's the chief of game b <laughs> <laughs> he, he's that man is a doer you know it, it doesn't yeah. take much to convince him to get moving on something right mm. to like let's see it tangible let's see it realized right the sage can sit there and 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 philosophize and think about the perfect master plan all day all for the whole <laughs> life you know yeah. and continue to argue and by the way feel like it's fruitful like here they are sitting at the end of their life and they're like okay i think we're i think we're getting somewhere now <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, but 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 it's that cr the creative tension between mm -hmm. you know the heart of a community embodied in a person and uh, and the and the and the brilliant light of a luminary, the sage, mm -hmm. and then and then the you know the fantastic sort of concrete energy of a doer. Mm -hmm. Now these three need to work together. And and by the way, they're all in us. The the three are in us individually as well. We we all have hearts, minds, and bodies, and um, we need to and, and we need to do what we can to cohere them to the degree that we're actually making meaningful change in the world and 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 constructing that meaning for ourselves that right. feels satisfying on a soul level mm. you know yeah 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 and, I, and i'm getting this sense of like yeah you and i and it sounds like this is what you were pointing to they're both extremely necessary in the sense of like yeah. if you have the doer without any sort of wisdom and you just exactly. get like rampant rampant capitalism or whatever is happening right. in the world today right. you know, because it's just all doing and then it's yep. never like well why are we doing this what's the wisdom behind it what are we working yes. towards right whereas again you can have the the sage the the armchair yes. philosopher, right on well, the other exactly hand. and this is what attracted me so much to game b because i'm looking at these guys uh and girls you know and i'm like whoa like these people are no joke like jim rutt 
you know, and Jordan Hall and Dinah Schmack, they fucked some shit up. Like, <laughs> uh, they, they seem to really have a capacity to think deeply about, you know, second and third order consequences of their actions really? and, you know, make it happen and, you know, hold that in a container in a community of space where they're going to uh, listen to what wants to emerge and not just, you know, kind of go the top down route that we're so used to in game A. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what's so exciting to me about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love to bring in this point as well. Um, I found it so fascinating in what Cadell was saying of like, we, of, you know, I think, I think sometimes the straw man of game B is like to, like game B is trying to develop coherence, you know, it's trying to, it's mm -hmm. like, like, how do we create mass coherence? And it feels like the kind of straw man of that is, is kind of viewing coherence as peace among everyone, right? As, right. as that's what coherence it's pre -tragic. is. Pre-tragic. Right, yeah. pre-tragic. Whereas- No, no, we need, we need post-tragic coherence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess what I was getting the sense of is like, what Cadell was bringing forth was that you need, he, he, he loves like uh, the dialectic, like framing things in terms mm. of dialectics, but like how I understand dialectics is like, you need tension between two opposing That's paradoxical right. things. And you yes. actually working with the tension and working with the paradox is actually how, you know, things happen. Wisdom is developed. Bingo. Coherence is yes. developed. Right. And so it almost feels like, like what I, I guess the sense I'm getting is like coherence is not the same as not having tension and paradox or not working. Whereas the kind of straw man is that, oh, if you have coherence and all tension and paradox and grappling with opposing things, it's gone. Right. No, I, yeah, exactly. I think, I think, I think game B's definition of coherence would, it would have to include constructive, you know, tension, right? Because it's just, it's just, you know, it's a natural you know, evolutionary dynamic force, you know, that, that we almost reckon with. Yeah. Totally, totally. Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm cur yeah, I'm curious of diving into the, the dark renaissance stuff more if you're interested. Sure. I'm, curious, I'm curious how you're holding all of that. Uh, the, I mean, I'm sure it's pretty fresh in your mind. Uh, a couple of days ago, I'm curious how right. you're you're holding the whole. You know, I, I I guess my question would be: I'm curious to hear your kind of summary or your, um, steel man of what the dark renaissance is and how it's in in, uh, kind of. It feels almost like an opposing force to game B. Mm. Well, I, I do agree with Cadell and Bard that, uh, you know, because you have you have thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. And one of the things that's kind of come out of the form is that actually maybe if we hold game B on the thesis and dark renaissance on the antithesis, um, let's keep that dia dialogos going. Let's keep that dialectic going for a while before we begin to synthesize, right? Because... And, and I think it's a great idea. It's just gotten started, right? And it's and there's a lot of heat. Oh my God, there's a lot of heat. <laughs> just go in there and look at that thread, man. Uh, you know, and it's blowing up all over social media. Um, so I think this is good. I think this is fantastic. And you know, like I said, uh, I, I have to admit it was a little bit part of my intention going into this. Right. I, I thought these two communities deserved each other. Really? All right so love, we're gonna do that, that. we're, we're gonna continue to play it out and uh stay tuned because uh we got a rebuttal we got <laughs> we got a, re a rebuttal on the way yeah yeah <laughs> uh but yeah i mean uh I, i'm this is this is all this is all my nutrition man as an artist you know um because coming out on the other side of this and 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 digesting this you know is 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 exactly what i need to evolve myself as an artist right mm -hmm. and um it's funny though actually i did i told i told bard this um 
I did actually submit a second script <laughs> that was exceedingly more pathic and it got rejected by Jim. Now, I don't know why he rejected it, but, mm -hmm. but there is a question of skillful means that needs to be brought up, right? This film was not a pure and raw expression of art, right? Like we had, we had a goal, like we're trying to, in some sense, explain, you know, some fundamental concepts related to game B, you know? Right. So we could have gone the explainer route, the pure logos route, and, and just made it a dry, you know, boring corporate looking explainer. Um, but I thought, oh, let's pull in a little myth. I said, I know if I, if I create something that slips between that, that, that art and 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 the logos that it's going to piss a lot of people off and that's mm. going to get a conversation started right, right, right so you have your art right. you have your people coming at this thing like it's like it's a film and and, and dropping film criticism on it <laughs> <laughs> and, and, right right and they're like oh this isn't fucking art you know this is this is this is fucking propaganda fuck you <laughs> and, and then you know and then you have your logos people on the other side going oh you know i would have explained it differently you know you didn't quite uh, uh get to the heart of it and so forth and blah 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 so it just slipped right in that in-between space um mm -hmm. to get enough people riled up on every side <laughs> and i think that's great because what we ultimately need to do here right is cultural reproduction we need to be auto poetic in the sense that there's this great quote by uh jean-luc godard he says Art is not a reflection of reality. It is the reality of a reflection. Mm. Right? Art is not a reflection of reality. It is the reality of a reflection. So in some sense, it's like when you do art, you're, you know, you're exposing yourself. You're exposing your epistemic ne negligee, right? You're, <laughs> you're dancing about. And, and then people look at it and critique it and say, oh, I could do better than that. Let me show you how it's done. You know, let me inch towards. Mm. I think you almost you, you nailed parts of the vibe, but you didn't get the full vibe. Let me show you. Let me show you how to do that. Right. right. This is exactly what we need to happen. That's mm. cultural reproduction. Mm. Right. So I'm looking forward to uh, uh, other projects, you know, in, in the liminal web. Um, and this discussion this, you know, this. Dialogue is happening between the dark renaissance and game B. It's exactly what, you know, it, it, it should produce. So right, right. very much looking forward to that. And I, and I welcome any and all, mm. any and all participation. I think it, fundamentally it comes down to temperament, you know, like, but there is also that question of, which is fully ironic, by the way, I, I am so utterly pathic in my life and in my art <laughs> but for this particular piece it ended up being like this cool little fairy tale yeah. like that could get, you could you know you wouldn't feel uncomfortable giving to your children you know uh, have never done anything <laughs> like that before but and, and then the one time and now i get the dark renaissance up my ass it's just hilarious <laughs> the sweet sublime irony of it is just magnificent that's hilarious. Oh, yes yes but you know I'll have to go dark after this, I'm sure. Uh, I just, I felt it in my body. Even after I wrote it, I said, I'm going to have to create something real dark after this. <laughs> but, but no, I think on a constructive level, you know, I am interested in that conversation around that soul journey from pre-tragic, from pre-tragic to tragic to post-tragic. You know, what does, what does, post-tragic art look like mm. you know yeah well, yeah it, yeah and i was gonna i was gonna bring up this point as well and i i found it so fascinating how you're whole how you're existing in relationship to this piece that you made right because yeah. you know it would seem natural you know if you're just getting like a freaking hellstorm of of critiques on a film like it's very easy to go into sort of like you know defense mode of like that's not what i was trying to do like i i understood there's right. pathos there i just oh, didn't that, put it in and stuff like this that's obnoxious yeah 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 exactly <laughs> and it feels like you're holding in a completely different way of like yeah. 
Yeah, bring it on. I love it. I love it. Uh-huh. Bring on the criticism. Just know? don't just just don't spell my name wrong, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, and it, yeah, and I get the sense of like not and I really really appreciate that, you know, of like uh if to me it feels like if you do art well, it'll get criticism. You know, if you do art well, it'll piss some people off. That's Whereas right. if you don't do it well, then people won't really love it, but they also won't criticize it. It'll be somewhere in the middle, you know? And so yes. it feels like to me, the, the desire I have within myself is to create art that gets criticism. You know, I'm like, if it gets criticism, it's like amazing, amazing. Oh, it yeah. someone off. It struck a chord deep enough in someone that they, that they were motivated enough to take the time to really actually critique this thing that I put out in the world. Amen, man. That's it. I think that's the appropriate <laughs> that's the appropriate way to hold it uh, for our times you know again this goes back I mean you know I think by holding it that way you're almost playing a non-zero sum game right mm-hmm. um, you know it's it's not as if one piece of art is the winner and the rest are the losers <laughs> so funny you know? sounds. yeah you know, like, sounds crazy. Even, even just saying that like yeah. all right, this piece of art's gonna be the winner. It's gonna be, be the winner. Than all of these others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you know that's why that's why uh, you know these award shows in Hollywood are kind of falling apart in the culture. You know, this, right. the viewership is dropping like crazy. It's just people are going, "What do you mean? Like, like how can you just pick one?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right. I'm fast. I'm, I'm fascinated to actually bring the dialogos component in here, right? Because mm-hmm. I, it feels a little bit more difficult to 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 hold that same infinite game kind of energy with dialogue than it is with art, right? Because it just it's obviously sounds weird to say this piece of art is the winner, right? right. But in 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 a, in a in a sort of dialogue um in, in that way of of working with ideas and i I, th- I would say art too you know i would say philosophy mm-hmm. is a form of art you know talking about philosophy yes. is kind of an artistic thing whereas it feels much easier like oh this position is going to win over this position right or, or this position needs to be in battle with this position whereas like and so then you get you get this sort of game theoretic you know uh dominant trying like people trying to dominate others with their positions and their worldviews and their beliefs right where it something something in me feels like the the same way of like this art is a winner versus this one like it, al- right. it almost feels generative to bring that into dialogue as well what do you mean what do you mean this position is a winner against this one like that like right. what, like that's stupid exactly i'm with you man absolutely no, I mean, and I think, you know, that goes back to serious play, you know, we were talking about serious play mm-hmm. earlier. And I think the way John Verveke holds the dialogos is certainly in, in that regard, right? Um, you know, you can co- almost like stage a play of an argument, mm-hmm. right? And then you've got, you got dunking on each other and so forth. It's like the dunking in a game, it's, it's, this, it's this, you know, <laughs> you know it's just like, it's just like boom i just dunked on you like <laughs> you know a little bit of flair but yeah. it, but, the, but that's what but it you know it creates a spark mm-hmm. creates a, a flash of light that people are like huh what's going on over here man mm. you know and uh you know that's 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 the kind of shit that creates meaning in life right mm-hmm. when you feel like you belong in a community and you're co-creating on that level, or especially like when you're, you know, a lot of these people like Jordan Hall, like, God, there's so many like dialogues with Jordan Hall and John Rebakey and all these people in the liminal web. And you just listen to it and you're, and you're just watching them c- kind of like evolve their, you know, thinking in right, real time. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love Rebakey's, I was, I was really brought, as you were speaking, I was really brought forth with Verveke's idea of uh, agent arena relationship. He speaks a lot about mm-hmm. uh, agent arena. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that as being a way to kind of work with the meaning crisis, you know, what, what, uh, like changing the arena, like, all right, how do we actually yeah. construct an arena that that is yes. more meaningful than the one we have now? And 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious if this sparks anything in you. I, I'm really getting this sense of like, by creating the film that you created, yeah. it almost like constructed a new arena where there wasn't one before. It's almost like mm. creating yeah. a film in like, the, in like kind of being open to critiques created this new arena of like, all right, here's this arena between game B and dark Renaissance. Mm. And then mm -hmm. uh, what, where do you want to be? What type of agent do you want to be in this arena? And how do you mm -hmm. want to, how do you want to participate in, in this arena of, you know, that was created by this piece of art. And, and it almost feels like what's coming up is, is what, what I just said a little bit earlier as well of like, you know, art, like it, it feels like what makes art meaningful. It's like, all right, if this piece of art like created an arena, then it, then it feels very generative. Whereas if it's, yes. if it's not really divisive enough, then it's not going to create an arena and nothing's going to happen after you kind of put it out into the world. Right. Or you're just going to, yeah, kind of reinforce an existing ideology or narrative, right? Right. The, the, yeah. the fascinating stuff, and this is why they, they talk about the liminal web, you know, the fascinating stuff is, the, is, is what's in between. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's in between this and this is why everybody will tune in to a great debate you know uh oh here's the clash of two worlds you know uh and it's always fruitful and this by fucking joe rogan is the number one media personality on the planet for fuck's sakes i mean he comes in and he brings you know you know people from vastly different you know arenas agents from vastly different arenas and he just goes head to head you know and it's it's beautiful to watch yeah yeah i mean i think that's cultural creation you know i think it, you know exploring new niches in culture right um and and doing it oh god I, yeah i'm i'm mm. very very uh interested in kind of doing that in a in a strategic or <sighs> inspired way you know strategic maybe that carries some baggage <laughs> it makes you think like you got some ill intent or something but the art of war do, something. right right but no doing it doing it with the intent because you know i really think these like i said i think these two two factions really deserve each other and and a strong mm -hmm. set i mean i think they're both like heavy hitters when it comes to their philosophical depth you know right it's just yeah so it's like you know you don't want to have you, you know you don't put the you don't put the lightweight in the you know in the ring with the heavyweight do you you <laughs> gotta get the you gotta get the heavyweight with the heavyweights <laughs> the lightweights with the right, lightweight right yeah right. yeah mm -hmm. so so the the whole experience of creating this film releasing it having the the talk around it the critiques creating this arena um what's next <laughs> what do you have do you have any Ooh. any projects in mind or do you have a direction you you feel really called to go in after all of this you know came to fruition mm. yeah right now you know we're gonna let we're gonna let it, it you know it has a life of its own we're gonna let that ride out i think i think you're gonna be seeing a another i think you're gonna be seeing a, a, a direct dialogos between these two factions soon uh, mm. soon on, on the stoa <laughs> yeah. uh, and and then you know and then we you know we just start picking the fruits from it man i mean mm. uh i have been oh, gosh so many people have reached out from such disparate such a disparate range of cohorts to me privately i've had mm. multiple messages a day ever since the and calls uh, ever since the film came out really? range of different people from all kinds of different contexts and arenas you know, regen people, you burner people, you like startup conscious capitalist people. I had mm -hmm. hardcore business people. So yeah, we're we're I'm in an exploratory phase. We're kind of letting the field populate with potential, and then we're gonna see what uh, you know where the heart takes us. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a meeting set up with a uh, group of diverse uncolonized middle schoolers in south portugal really that love that yes that love the film and they want to talk to the filmmaker and we're going to see what we can create out of that you know these kids with, Dude, with awesome. real futurity yeah i have a 
I had the owner of, a, of an executive coaching firm working with a billion dollar company uh, who wants to develop more resources and practices for their firm. Mm. I've had a philanthropist reach out wanting to rev up the, the game B engine, whatever that may mean. <laughs> <laughs> We're in talks, man. We got a lot in the field right now. Mm. It's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. No. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. I can't even imagine just having it all kind of come to you. You know, like, all right, well, what am I gonna choose? You know, here's all these different directions. Only got so much time in the day, but here's all. Oh, these we're gonna be where you be out. Projects. We're going to be reaching out to you and everybody else in the limited field to help us because <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, it, ultimately we have to be co-creative here, right? So. Totally, totally. And, and, and I would like to, when the time is right, I would like to do a synthesis uh, between these two factions. You know, mm -hmm. I already told Bard, man, next thing I'm writing, I'm, you know, you're, you're going to be on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Amazing, amazing. Is there, is there anything else you feel called to wrap up with or is there anything else, you know, after all the things that we discussed that still feels super alive or you want to, you know, complete? We covered some ground, man. Yeah, yeah. well done. Thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> yeah, of course. My pleasure. Uh, no, I just, you know, love to stay in the conversation and, and, um, you know, we'll see what emerges and, and whatever, whatever is moving people, then, you know, we'll go there. So, mm. so yeah, I'm, I'm staying open at the moment. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so nice having you on the, on the podcast. Likewise, it was great to be here. Ethan. Awesome.